Hello and welcome to Popcorn Mumbles, where we dig into the back catalog to select a film or television show to rewatch. I'm your host, Cody Nestor. Alongside me is my co-host, Todd Hill. What's going on, guys? This week, we've chosen the 1969 film on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Agent 007 and the adventurous Tracy DiVincenzo join forces to battle the evil Spectre organization in the treacherous Swiss Alps. But the group's powerful leader, Ernst Stavro Blofeld, is launching his most calamitous scheme yet, a germ warfare plot that could kill millions. On Her Majesty's Secret Service was released in the U.S. on December 18, 1969. On a budget of $8 million, it made $82 million. It has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 81% and an audience score of 64%. So, Todd, let's discuss on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Spoilers are ahead. Okay. So I'm going to ask you, Todd, so um, kind of something we've talked about before. Where were you? How? Where did kind of on Her Majesty's Secret Service rank to you? How did you feel about it before and now coming back to it? You know, I have always liked On Her Majesty's Secret Service, and in watching it here just within these past couple of days, I, I think I like it a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So On Her Majesty's Secret Service is the 10th novel in the 11th book in Ian Fleming's James Bond series. Um, the last Bond film we covered was You Only Live Twice. Mm -hmm. um, coming off of the Connerys, where the Connerys films had ended up, Obviously, Diminishing Returns, we mentioned that many times. This is a breath of fresh air, man. It is. It this really is. is. This is, uh, I, uh, I, don't, I don't know how many times I've actually seen Honor Majesty's Secret Service. Coming back to it now, um, I couldn't really tell you how I felt about it before. I kind of was like, I kind of indifferent on it. Right. And like, again, I've not seen many of these films since I was a lot younger, mm -hmm. especially some of these middle films. Like I'm more familiar with like watching the first few Conneries. I think I mentioned before I watched the first few Conneries. I skipped to Brosnan skipped, skipped. Yeah. and then go to Craig. Right. So like I kind of, you know, I don't have as much experience watching some of these before, but especially coming off the Conneries where we leave off and you only live twice, but like still just on its own, this is completely, it feels fresh. Yes. It feels like a return to form for the Bond film franchise. Right. Like I really, really thoroughly enjoyed it way more. It has its problems. Yeah. I'm not going to say it's perfect. Right. I'm not going to say it's not better than Goldfinger. It's not better than Casino Royale, but I could see making an argument and someone making an argument that it's like right in that tier right underneath it. Right. Like, this is one of, I think, one of the better Bond films, probably one of the most overlooked, if not the most overlooked Bond film. Um, before we get into the story, we kind of got to talk about, obviously, Connery's out. Connery's gone by now. Uh, a big, extensive search for the next James Bond was on. Yes. Uh, it, it eventually turned out that it was Australian model George Lazenby. George Lazenby. Um, now, as far as Bonds go, if you asked AI to create what James Bonds looks like, it's George Lazenby. Yeah, I mean, he as far as looking the part, George Lazenby is James Bond, and to, and I think sounding. I love the dude's voice too. Yeah, like I think he looks and sounds like Bond. If I made an idealized version of Bond in my head, like I probably can't do better than George Lazenby. Right. Like as far as casting goes, like this guy was an Australian model. He wasn't an actor. Um, we'll probably mention several things from it. So there's also not only spoilers for Honor Majesty's Secret Service, but there's also a fantastic Hulu documentary called Becoming Bond. Oh yeah. Uh, which you and I have both watched. I've, I've watched, watched that thing three times. Yeah. I watched, <laughs> uh, I watched kind of, uh, the, the, the later half of it, like where it's more about the bond and about this film. Yeah. I watched that again last night cause I knew we were doing the podcast. Super, super interesting, po uh, documentary. If you yeah. guys haven't watched it, like, it is very entertaining. Yeah. It's it's his story about, you know, kind of his life, where he came from. It's it, there's, there's sad in parts of it mm -hmm. about love and losing love and about expectations and, and everything that went into becoming Bond. Obviously, you know, the title, the namesake there. Very, very, very fantastic. And, I mean, it, it, it's, it's it gives you a lot of background and information and about why he walked away eventually from this role. Just a fantastic documentary. If you haven't seen it, highly, highly recommend it. Um, but, like, yeah, just getting into it, like, to cast a model who had never acted before, and there's a, a you know, kind of a, a little part of the documentary where um, 
you know, he obviously fooled Harry Saltzman. He fooled the casting director and everyone else into hiring him. He lied about <laughs> being in films before. He was saying he was in films in France and nowhere they could go check. Yeah, exactly. He was always starring in films in foreign countries. <laughs> exactly. And he he met the director uh, Peter Hunt here. Mm -hmm. So Peter Hunt was a longtime editor for some of the uh, very best Bond films, Doctor yep. Knows and From Russia with Love. Always an editor. Um, and he was given finally. He kind of edited around a little bit. Uh, for You Only Live Twice. I think they kind of got rid of the original editor. I think she was considered doing a poor job of it. Peter mm -hmm. Hunt was kind of brought in. And the way he kind of saved that film in some ways with the editing, uh, I think it was Saltzman or Broccoli. I'm not sure who, but they're like, hey, we're going to give you a shot behind the camera of doing Honor Her Majesty's Secret Service. And so he comes in with kind of a fresh new style for it as well. But Lazing be met with him, and it was just like, hey, listen, <laughs> I'm not really an actor. Right. I'm a model. I've never been in front of a film camera and acted before for and he's like hey you feel you you kind of fooled two of the biggest bastards in the industry so as far as i'm concerned you're an actor right so the whole story is just so interesting it's amazing really and when the you think guy, about it lazenby himself i mean obviously he was a male model but like as far as guys who like kind of live the lifestyle of a james bond besides the espionage it's that guy it's him yeah like just betting broads and <laughs> a lot of a lot of like you know very uh sexy escapades that right. was kind of george lazenby's early life yeah um but yeah getting back on point here like the dude just looks the part he looks the part he definitely does uh and the film starts off i think i love the opening the opening pre-title sequence with, uh, you see, it's like kind of uh, shadowed. The car, the camera's mounted inside the car. kind of showing his lower jaw as he's lighting a cigarette. Yeah. They're not really revealing anything yet. They're kind of, you know. You get Bond, uh, you're, you're kind of, the car, the, the camera's mounted in the, the back seat. It's, it's a lot of like, dark and shadows. He's driving through this beautiful kind of scenery. Uh, he's not been seen by, you know, MI6 for a while. He's kind of off doing his own thing. Mm -hmm. He ends up, uh, you know, Bond and windy roads and women and cars. <laughs> he's got to chase after He's got to chase after him. So uh, a, a girl overtakes him in a, in a, in a car. Uh, she ends up pulling off the side of the road onto a beach. He follows her down. He sees that uh, she's uh, going into the water to looks like she's going to maybe drown herself. Maybe drown herself. Mm -hmm. So he kind of jumps into action. He kind of springs in, takes her out of the water. Then right there we get a couple of, uh, of goons looking for Bond himself, and he has a, a nice little fight mm -hmm. uh, with those two bad guys on the beach there. The action in this movie feels a lot different than the rest of the, the other Bond films that came before. It feels heavier. It feels more kind of realistic kind of and more raw, raw yeah and raw exactly it has like it has that kind of feel to it a lot of like camera work and i think a lot of uh kind of innovative camera work there's some of it that does work really good and there's some of it that's a little bit more clunky but like most of the action in this film was really good it kind mm -hmm. of reminds you of those really kind of visceral raw fight like with uh, the red grant fight in exactly from yeah. russia with love it has that vibe and that that kind of feel to it and then um we see the girl that Bond was kind of chasing after. Uh, she at first, you think I thought she was jacking his I thought car. Thought was stealing his car. Yeah, yeah, I was like, oh my god. <clears throat> well, let me talk about the car real quick. I love that car. That's I. I, I had totally it's forgot better. about that car. It's better than the DB5. That's an opinion. awesome car. Yeah. It's the uh, it's a it's a Aston Martin. Um, I think it's the DB5 uh, Va uh, Vantage is what it's mm -hmm. called. I prefer that car, honestly. If I had, we talked about before in one of these videos, mm -hmm. if I had a choice of like you would take the any Vantage. movie car, I would probably take that one. I think Timothy Dalton drives that one later on, doesn't he? Or something similar? I, I think it's something similar. Now, don't quote us because we'll have to get there. Yeah, we'll have to get <laughs> I know there. I will because yeah. I ain't got no memory it's for shit. It's something similar, but man, I love that car. Mm -hmm. um, but she takes off, she peels away in her car and we get our uh, opening credit sequence. Uh, I love the music. I love that soundtrack that that uh, that that John Barry put together, but uh, I don't feel like what we see visually is that interesting. Yes, yeah, just kind of old clips from the previous movies, kind of filtering through. Looks like they start out as martini glasses. Yes, and uh, you kind of get a lot of uh, kind of British imagery. Yeah, a lot of Union Jacks, and I mean, you get girls and nipples and all that kind of right. stuff pointing out very, you know, pointy breasts and all that classic Bond stuff. But it's not as visually interesting as some of the other uh, actual sequences that have come before it. And I guess it was nice to kind of see that um, 
you know the old clips from the other Bond yeah. films. And that stuff score like that. was great. The score is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Like that that it's like right up there, like right behind like the actual John Barry, like mm-hmm. you know James Bond theme. Like I equate that in my head to like iconic Bond soundtrack stuff. Um, we should mention the barrel opening too. So George goes to a knee and go, fires. Drops yet. to one knee, mm-hmm. which is also talked about in the documentary. He just he went, they were like, do it like Connery, and he's like, I don't want to. Right. Like, and he dropped to a knee, and I'm like, it works. It's not. Yeah. It's, it's nothing. Uh, nothing bad about it. it. It completely and utterly works. And before we get too far ahead, we we can't not mention the uh, the line before the pre credits. Oh. And the fourth wall break, I think. You're absolutely <laughs> right. Uh, tell us about that. So as uh, Tracy drives back up in Bond's car to get her car and drives away, he's kind of left there alone on the beach, and he just like, huh, this never happened to the other fella, looks right at us in the camera. This never happened to the other fella. And it works. It's awesome. It works. It works. <laughs> and, I mean, there's always, you, you've heard that film theory of Bond is a, is a code name, not a person. Right. And that's really not. It doesn't work in in these films, but like yeah. that's an idea I've always wished they would explore in Bond films mm-hmm. is to go and make a Bond film or a series of Bond films that does have it being a code name that is inherited. You know, I think that would be a neat idea. There, that's a film theory out there. If you guys haven't heard about that before, something to kind of check out. It's a cool idea. It doesn't really apply here. This film lives in a weird world between. Um, it, it, it's connected to the others, but it kind of lives in its own way. Feels too. like its own its own thing, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like a what we would kind of consider today kind of a soft reboot. You know how right. like you take uh, you know let's say you have the original like. Uh, run of the Halloween films and you say Halloween 2018 we're going to forget about everything but one and two right or right. No, one I should say or you have uh, Terminator Dark Fate we're going to forget about everything except Terminator 1 and Terminator 2 it's one of those films like we're going to take we're going to acknowledge some films and forget about others like kind of like we're going to acknowledge Dr. No and then From Russia With Love but we're not going to acknowledge something like You Only Live Twice mm-hmm. things like that which we'll talk about why uh, but something else I wanted to mention so like about Lazenby um, before we kind of jump into the story here. So like holistically, Sean Connery is like the best Bond. If you look at it from like the whole, everything considered. Right. He started it, everybody's image and, and of what they expected out of Bond and how Bond is supposed to be was kind of set by him. Yeah. But I feel like Sean Connery was asked to play like a fully realized version of James Bond. Mm-hmm. Like there was no real growth or development. Like, Whereas George Lazenby, he got to play more of like a humanized version of Bond, who's he's not already the world's best super spy. He feels like more like well adjusted and like vulnerable and empathetic and like than like a Connery does. Like I can't imagine Connery's Bond falling in love and having his heart broken. Right, right. Like it I just don't I don't I don't see that from that Bond. And that's nothing against Connery. Yes. Like he just he kind of was playing a more realized bond. What I would consider, I would consider that bond. If I look at it in, in the canon of my own head, like a later bond, later in his career, a more established, bond. experienced bond. Experience. I see Lazenby as more of an early days bond, right? Like you know, maybe two or three years into the you know under Majesty Secret Service, okay. so to speak. Um, but take us through our story, Todd. What's going on here? What's the assignment? What are we, what are we doing here in honor? So Majesties? basically, we had we found out that Bond had been working on an operation called Bedlam, which was basically an effort to track down Blofeld. Uh, that's where we, we kind of you know he's kind of off doing his own thing when he first meets Tracy. Mm-hmm. Uh, they meet up again at like a sort of a hotel casino. Uh, they're kind of playing cards. Uh, you know, he kind of stakes Tracy some money because she don't have any because she loses. <laughs> <laughs> she makes a big bet. Right. She loses. can't cover. So James kicks in the money for her. Uh, uh, they kind of, you know, go up, to, he's going up to her room and, uh, you know, he's, you know what, you know, she's kind of, you know, I'll, I'll pay you back, you know, mm-hmm. the only way I guess she could pay him back. <laughs> yeah, she he she's supposed to he's supposed to go to her room. Supposed to go to her room, but, he, but the he goon does, the he, goon is there. Yeah. yeah, he goes to her room and he gets attacked by a goon that we don't really know who 
at first is working for. Yeah, yeah. And he has a fight, which is another kind of good little fight with nice. the goon, yeah. and then goes back to his room to find Tracy. Tracy's in his room, yes. Yeah. I love the first interaction kind of between them. Like, there's that, she, she's she got his Walther, and she's like, you know, what if I just, like, killed you for a thrill? And he's like, I th- think of more, something more sociable to do. Right. And he, like, grabs her, and then he's, like, trying to get information from her, and he's James Bond, and it's the 60s, so he gives her a little... Wrap little across, slappy slap. little wrap across the cheek, yeah. and like I, the interaction is really, really, really good. And they kind of they're out on the little uh, little balcony there, and she kind of is the one that initiates, you know, the the sexy time, not Jimmy. Yeah, he tells her to like go to get dressed. Doesn't yeah, he? yeah, he's you know he's kind, but she's like, nah, I'm gonna pay this debt, <laughs> <laughs> right? So uh, he wakes up the next morning, still out on the the balcony, but of course she's gone. Uh, he tries to call her room; she's checked out. Uh, he notices his gun is gone. Mm-hmm. He goes downstairs, and uh, a couple of more goons just waiting for him. And he's like, hey, you missing something? <laughs> they got his gun. <laughs> <laughs> so they proceed to take James. Uh, you know, they get him in a car. Like one guy that he fought the night before has got a knife at his ribs. Mm-hmm. And uh, they take him to see Tracy's father, uh, Drago. Am I getting that right? Drago? Drago? Draco. Uh, Draco. I don't want to pronounce it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, this, uh, that, that fight in that hallway going into his office... It's like cannon fire. Did you pay any attention to that? How hard it is? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's like the 4th of July. It's like every punch is like, pom, 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 You're right. You're right. It's, uh, it's very hard here. Yeah, you yeah. are right. So basically, Bond makes his way into her father's office, and, uh, you know, he kind of more or less lets James know that, you know, Tracy's a good girl. She just don't, you know, she does have, she needs a little... She needs a rudder in her life. She's just a good man to. He's just know, a dominator. The dominator, yeah. Yeah, and he's like, she's already told me everything you've done for, her. and he's yeah. like, everything. <laughs> like, uh, like and he's like, you want the job? And he's like, well, you know, this, this, it's not for me. <laughs> yeah, and he's like, if uh, he's like, the day you marry my daughter, I'll give you a million pounds right. and like all this stuff, and like he's like, just like. Just, just try it. He's like, that's yeah. basically what he's saying. Just try it out. Yeah. Like, I know she's not the easiest person, but I'll give you a million bucks if you do it. Eh, you know, and, just and James kind of drops the, you know, I may be more interested in your underworld connections. You maybe can help me find Blofeld. Yes. He's like, well, I, I'm not going to do it for Her Majesty, but I might do it for my future son-in-law. Exactly. <laughs> uh, we get, uh, from that point, we do get Bond kind of going back. Uh, MI6 has obviously been looking for him. He's kind of mm-hmm. been MIA for a little bit, again, looking for Blofeld. Um I really like the interaction he has with uh, Money Penny again. Lois Maxwell is back. Yes, Bernard Lee is back as M. So mm-hmm. we have the holdovers for again. Not much else is changing. You know, some things change, but then some things stay the same. Stay constant. So, like MI six does. I love the interaction with uh, Money Penny though, because like you know, he's doing his 007 thing, and she's like, you know, same old James until he like grabs her ass, <laughs> and she's like, only more now, like kind of thing. And it's like, okay, this he, this bond's a little bit. He's different. a little bit more friskier. He's a little friskier, exactly. Um, I like that Bond has an office in this film. I think the first and only time we ever see James Bond in his office. I never <laughs> considered he had an office at MI6. Me Honestly, I thought he'd just come and go, and he never had a, a place to call home in terms yeah. of work. But uh, he's got a desk full of nostalgia. He's got a desk that has Honey Rider's knife from uh, Dr. Right. No, uh, Red Grant's watch yeah. from, uh, from Russia with Love, and uh, his rebreather. From Thunderball, uh, from Thunderball. Yeah. Uh, this was uh, this was uh, I guess fan service in 1969. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the member berries for back then. <laughs> exactly. Uh, we get uh, Bond heading off. Uh, Bond and Tracy kind of end up meeting again at uh, her father's birthday party. Right. Um, and uh, they have a great little kind of exchange there um, where she's kind of – she's introduced to him again, and uh, she's kind of cold to him. And he's like, uh, Madame always makes one feel so welcome. Like, <laughs> uh, And they, they just have a really good chemistry. They do. They really do, which is kind of funny because I read that Diana Rigg and George Lazenby didn't get along. Didn't get along, yeah. <laughs> I, I think in some of the Becoming Bond stuff um, – she kind of doesn't have too many nice things to say about him, especially yeah. after the decision he would make to like kind of right. walk away and kind of leave. Hey, acting's acting, and they be- you make it believe it here. Exactly, they got great chemistry. Um, you know, this movie is underrated, and I think she is another underrated and overlooked kind of Bond girl. I mean, she's like 
I don't, she's not even, I really wouldn't even consider, I think calling her a Bond girl is kind of an insult to that character. Yeah. But uh, she's, she's very much overlooked. She's a very beautiful woman. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but she is like, she's really, she has a good chemistry with him, the actress, and like they have a very good dynamic. And like I said, calling her a Bond girl is a disservice to that character. But their, their entire relationship and dynamic over the course of the film is very, very, yeah. very well done. I'm glad you brought that up because I was thinking after I was right, you know, getting ready to do my notes for this. You think about Tracy, and if you think about a a girl in a movie that had that much impact on James Bond, you know his you know his life. You don't really get another, in my opinion, impactful female till you get to Vesper Lynn. Mm-hmm. Really, yeah. Honestly, I have, I have another <laughs> takeaway. We'll we'll talk about kind of the same kind of thought that I have about it once we get towards the end here. But yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, her father, um, going back to the story, he's like, you know, uh, again, she has that kind of cold reception to Bond. He's yeah. like, she likes you. I can see it. Yeah. And Bond's like, you have to give me the number to your Oculus. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> like, she kind of gets the feeling that something's up. She's like, what's Papa done? What's, what's, what's he up to? Right. Exactly. Like she's making, he's making some, and she, she confronts him about it at the dinner table. Mm-hmm. She's like, you know, what have you, it, basically she sees that he's trying to kind of arrange this marriage and this kind of setup and those kind of things. Yeah. Um, but kind of moving along. Along, uh, to some, uh, we get towards some more of our espionage and into our stump, uh, story here. Uh, talk about Gumbald. So uh, her father puts him on to a lawyer. I, I don't. What was it? Was it Burn? Burn. 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 Yeah, Burn. Burn. Yeah. Gumbald. A, a lawyer named Gumbald that may have been doing a little bit of work for Blofeld. So uh, Bond makes his way there. Uh, he kind of waits till uh, he goes out for his lunch hour. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess Bond has a skeleton key. He kind of lets his. I think he in. lifts it off. Does, I, well, all right, did the, he lift it off? See, of that's him? the thing. Yeah, I, I don't know. That. I like he, he did. because like they have a little shot outside where he's kind of digging in his pockets, mm-hmm. and he pulls out something else. And I couldn't tell what it was, and I didn't go back to look at it. I should have. I kind of got the impression he lifted he, the key okay, off. Okay, baby, he did. But I might be wrong. Okay. If if you if you've seen this film enough times, tell us in the comments yeah, if, we're, if we're right or wrong. But I'm gonna say he lifted off him. But if not, I. I was also, I was like, is that a skeleton key or is yeah. he going to pick the lock? Right. But I think he lifts the key. Could have been. So he makes his way into the office. Uh, he kind of goes out to the, to the window and he's looking down at a construction site and he sees a blonde headed guy down there. Mm-hmm. That's an accomplice. Uh, he kind of puts a brief black, large kind of, you know, box looking thing into a, into a bucket and they kind of swing it over all the way across the road. James lifts it out, brings it inside. He's got a safe cracking device. It's a, yeah, it's a safe cracking device slash copier. <laughs> right. Uh, it's very ahead of his time. Yeah. But I like that compared to You Only Live Twice where he's got the fucking thing in his pocket. Yeah. Like it's it's more espionage. It's more realistic to like have to set it up to get some kind of big ass device, even though the device looks it's like a it's something out of a, a late 1960s movie. Yeah. And it's like a little too fanciful and uh, a little too weird. It's got big, you know, red and green and yellow buttons right. on it. It's, it's a little bit over designed. But like it. It's it's better that it's something like that. It's yeah. clever, and it's like it's a way to like for him to do that and use a gadget that's not like he doesn't have it on him at all fucking times. Right, like right. He's Batman, you know what I mean? Like he's got <laughs> right. a utility belt. He doesn't have like yeah yeah. Let exactly. me pull out my safe cracker copier device here. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, all that stuff is great. So he's waiting for it to do its thing, and it's taking a little time. So he's going to read the paper, and inside the paper he finds ah oh, a Playboy, a Playboy, yeah. which you <laughs> which he, he takes with him when he and leaves. when you leave the <laughs> office, you can clearly see that centerfold because trust me i went back and checked folks <laughs> <laughs> like you could clearly see some uh some joblies in that uh, in that <laughs> centerfold for sure um <laughs> but uh yeah from there um we kind of introduced to the idea of uh again that 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 kind of puts him onto some documents and basically he's figured out where uh blofeld potentially might be um, and that kind of gets us into the the subplot here that introduces him, that gives him his his way into Blofeld's new world, which right. is Sir Hillary Bray. Sir Hillary Bray. Talk, talk about Sir Hillary Bray and how all this plays out to get Bond up to uh, Blofeld's lair. So in those documents, he kind of sees that uh, Blofeld is trying to establish a, a genealogy, a, 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 a connection to, I think it's... The Blochamp? Yeah, Balthazar de Blochamp. The Blochamp. Like the, 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 the Balthazar de Blochamp family. He's trying to uh, get a precedence that he is somehow 
uh, inheriting that count title and is right. part of that family. And he's trying to get Sir Hilly Bray, who's a genealogist, to come out to where he is to kind of certify and research that. At the College of Arms in England. And I thought it was cool, too, that, you know, James kind of mentions that he tried to was getting in with Sir Hilary Bray and had him look up his own genealogy. Mm-hmm. And that's the first time we get the mention of the Bond family motto, which is the world is not enough. Exactly. <laughs> and I think it's on Her Majesty's Secret Service. I think that's where it was wrote in by Ian Fleming that he has that Scottish ancestry because it wasn't right. originally like that. But then when Connery got cast, I think that's where in the book, yeah. I can't remember if it's mentioned anything here. I don't think it is, but I know in the book, I think is where it's introduced that Scottish ancestry. So that brings us to our plot device where uh, Bond is going to take the place of Sir Hilary Bray. He's going to, you know, act his part. He's going to go out to Switzerland and he's going to have the meeting with Blofeld to kind of get in. Yeah. <laughs> and it's cool too, that he's like, they talk about and they set up that he's like, spent the time trying to like yeah he studies with the guy yeah. and tries to learn about genealogy he's not half-assing it and just like yeah. bonding it like i would imagine in a previous movie like an end of the uh, connery or more area he would just half-ass it and yeah. just like buff his way through but like no the dude actually puts in the work and tries to convincingly play the role of a genealogist yes which was cool yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So he makes his way to Switzerland. Uh, he's met by uh, Irma Blunt. Mm. I guess you would say she's Blofeld's henchwoman. Yeah, <laughs> our first real, not, I mean, she's like, I mean, we've had like evil hench specter women, but like she's kind of like the odd job to his gold finger in terms of yeah. like, we've seen like, you know, Miss Brandt and some of those other female specter agents be like uh, down the line, but she's kind of like an odd job like type hench woman in, mm. in this one. I also like this. I think it's cool that how he kind of plays uh, Sir Hillary is kind of a, a milk sop. You know, he gets he gets air sick. Yeah, uh, he don't want to do this. He, he has a strength for that. <laughs> it's very Clark Kent Superman. It is. It is it's very yeah. much like a very much alter ego type play. Um, and uh, he kind of gets off the helicopter there, and uh, she introduces him to, I guess, the other people that are attending Blofeld's, uh, you know, institute or whatever. His Gloria. Yeah, Piz, Piz Galore or something like that. It's actually an institute for allergy research. Yes. And every patient is a bird, baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, every patient is a gorgeous young woman. A gorgeous woman. Of course. And um, there's and during the early conversation, he I guess there's a couple lines. I think there's like one line that he kind of makes about not having much experience or not knowing much about young girls or something like that. Yeah. And it's kind of like insinuated later on with some of the, the goings on with bond and these ladies that they had the feeling that he didn't like girls. Oh that yeah. That maybe yeah. Sir Hillary was, um, uh, of a different sexual orientation, so to speak. Right. That was probably not as, um, uh, commonplace in the not- late 1960s, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Um, not, not that it was commonplace, but not commonplace to see on film so much. Um, but what, uh, what's the goings on here, Todd? So like, this is some, it's some funny stuff. Like it's some stuff going on here with Sir Hillary Bray. So, uh, I think Hilly goes to, uh, they, they start calling him Hilly, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, he goes to, I think it's a supper with him. Yes. in his full Scottish kilt. Yeah. He's wearing his kilt and, uh, you know, he's dressed up to the nines and, uh, you know, he's just kind of, you know, telling, trying to teach him about genealogy and tracking back your family history and all that stuff. And he mentioned some kind of book he has. Mm-hmm. I think he left it in his room. And uh, It's about, like, the different things that, like, coats of arms and family right, crest right. can contain. And one and one of those things are is it Byzantz. Yes. Which and, and and one of the girls asks him, she's like, what are, what are those? And he's like, gold balls. <laughs> and he's like, my coat of arms has it. And, she, and he's like, four of them, like, kind of thing. And it's just right. like... What are we doing here? And what are we one, talking uh, about? Kind of, you know, lifts up his cute a little bit and writes something on his inner thigh and lipstick. And lipstick. Yeah. Yes. Now, there's a famous story in the Becoming Bond documentary that during that scene, uh, Lazenby and the uh, the boys in the crew actually took and boiled a, a big sausage <laughs> and t- taped it to his inner thigh to give her a little surprise when she actually reached down there. And to her credit, she was such an actress and she a professional. Didn't a <laughs> she didn't miss a beat. She didn't miss a beat. That. Good on her. Good on her. So Healy, A.K. James, he kind of figures out a way to kind of bypass that little uh, automatic door because mm-hmm. he can he he can't get out of his room. Only someone else can let him out come of the room. in. Yeah. 
So uh, he he makes his way out and uh, just starts making the rounds to all the ladies' rooms. Yes, he goes to that that girl has wrote the number eight on his on his leg or his inner thigh for her room number. He he meets her. Uh, he doesn't want her to turn on the light. He remarks about how beautiful he, she is in like the mean fire lit. Right. And has this whole little spiel and like then of course they they do the deed there and then he leaves from his room or from her room and goes back to his room and another one of the girls has waited for him there waiting for him there. And I love that he gives her the same spiel. And the he's same like, spiel. The same exact. <laughs> You're so beautiful in the firelight and all this stuff. Don't turn the light don't, on. Don't turn the light <laughs> on. And he gives her the same exact thing he just said to that girl. And uh, he ends up doing the deed with her as well. Um, <laughs> so um, one thing, he finally gets introduced to the count. Yeah, but he finally meets Blofeld. Yeah. And then that's where I'm like, okay, I got to do a Google because in this film, Blofeld and Bond don't. They haven't seen each other. Right. And I'm like, if you're going and if you're going in sequential order of the films, obviously you only live twice. They they've met. already met. They've met. So you're like, how the hell do they not know each other? Right. That's a good disguise, but it ain't that good. It ain't that good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So basically, again, we're, we're kind of picking and choosing which films are, are kind of canon at this point. You Only Live Twice is out. And, uh, you know, kind of from what I was looking at. So in the making of the film, screenwriter uh, Richard, uh, Richard Malbum stuck very closely to the original story when writing the screenplay for Honor Majesty's Secret Service. And Bond and Blofeld had not yet met at that point in the book. Yeah, I think in book release on Her Majesty came out before right. You Only Live Twice. So. Right, exactly. But at yeah. first I was like, I got to figure out what's going on here. Yeah, why um, do they not know each other? Yeah, exactly. Because I was like, does he know? And he's just fucking with him. But like, no, they hadn't actually, He was. they were aware of each other, of course, but they hadn't actually seen each other. They couldn't, right. have, they couldn't have picked each other out of a lineup. At least he couldn't have picked Bond out of a lineup. He, he could have picked Blofeld out of it, I'm sure. Uh, but he eventually does... Uh, come around to figuring out who 007 is because he makes sort of a gaffe. Yeah. Bond um, actually goes for one of his uh, rendezvous in a room and the girl in the bed is not who we want it to be. It's uh, Helga. Yeah, I love the reaction he has. It was like, was it? Fraulein, what are you doing here? Sorry, Irma, I'm sorry, yeah. not Helga. Is that old cow told you? <gasps> Fancy meeting you here, Fraulein. <laughs> yeah, and uh, he he gets knocked out, and like it's I just love his like his kind of reaction for it. And they uh, he you know he kind of men- he he meets Blofeld, and they're kind of reintroduced or introduced to each other for the first time. And we get a little bit of that you know bad guy tells your evil plan. And uh, do you want to kind of talk about what Blofeld's plan is here, Tom? Let me see if I can make my way through this. Yeah, it's a little. <laughs> I'm not. I was. I felt kind of bad. I'm like, am I dumb? This is a little <laughs> hard to follow in in a, in a way like what his actual plan is. So up front, he's actually treating these girls and curing them of these allergies, but he's also uh, subliminally uh, putting suggestions into their mind. You know, he's kind of, you know, the power of you know, suggestion, you know. Right, like almost like hypnosis. Yeah, in a part way. of their ritual is they're in their beds at night when this thing comes on above them, and it's like, you love chicken. <laughs> yeah. You do not hate yeah. chicken. One, one of the girls had an allergy to chicken. <laughs> chicken she right. would freak out. Yeah, you hear him like a, the voice of God, like, I've taught you to love chicken. Slay, that kind of stuff. <laughs> but actually, he's working up this kind of uh, toxin that's supposed to be able to just knock out like entire lines. Like, you know, poultry's gone. Yeah, you know, like cows will be gone. Wheat is gone. It's like a biological uh, warfare, basically. Like it would, it would eliminate. Like you could, you could introduce it to a certain species of plant, and it would make that plant go extinct, or right. a certain livestock, or potentially even human beings, if you wanted to push it that far. And these women are going to be the dispersers of this. We don't really know how at first, but we kind of see a little bit later on what they're given is what they're going to use to do it. Right, and it's and it's kind of hinted at, but I don't think it's actually. It's not shown that it was true, but it's kind of hinted at that they might not be the first crop that's actually out there right. of people, of women that he's done this to. He's kind of maybe introduced loads of these women that he's kind of put under this suggestive force to so maybe kind of, more of these like sleeper cells already out exactly, there. Exactly. That's a good term for it. A sleep, kind of a sleeper agent. Exactly. Um, but uh, he kind of locks Bond away in kind of the uh, the gear room for the chairlift. <laughs> yeah, the, the gear room for the lift. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I like how Bond escapes. He like tears his pockets out and kind of uses the, the 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 fabric to kind of hold onto those cables and like kind of climb through. And he he gets down off of the off of the lift itself, and then we he, we get him changing into a ski outfit. Yeah, he straps on a couple of seas, uh, uh, seas, uh, a couple of skis. I do like the the ski escape scene. 
Like uh, uh, anytime it's not Bond against a projection screen, that's a little wonky. Right. But anytime, like there's some great shots, like film from behind of him slicing through trees and a lot of the bad guys and stuff. Like there's a lot of good stuff in this. It is. Um, uh, I like how one of the goons flies off into a tree and another one's like idiot. <laughs> That's just it's just great stuff there. There's a, there's a point where you get an obvious dummy falling off a cliff, and it just holds on that shot for like for what feels like forever. That it's dummy like, get falling. off of that, get yeah, like of that. of that dummy falling. Um, <laughs> uh, he uh, Bond ends up they they end up chasing. He's heading towards a village. He's heading towards the village. Yeah. yeah, he ends up fighting with uh with some guy. He fights a guy in a room. It's like a hut filled with bales. Or something, you know what yeah, I'm talking what about? Yeah, was that? Yeah. I think it's bales. That's yeah. the only thing. Or like pots or something. Yeah. But I think they were kind of, like, they look like bales more than they did like pots. Um, but he's like trying to avoid them and trying to like get through the village. And there's like like a kind of a carnival going on. Mm-hmm. There's like an ice skating rink. And yeah. he kind of goes to the edge of that and kind of sits there. But first he bumps into, did you like the cackling polar bear guy? I see. <laughs> That was that was scary, wasn't it? He just like turns around and, <laughs> and then just keep kind of bond cackling thing, the, then, the, the goons then, cackling thing bond. And then you like <laughs> the, he goes away and like you still hear that guy cackling in mm-hmm. the background, like in other parts of the scene. Um, but I and really, it's great. But I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. You go. Ahead. I think it's great because he just kind of he sits down on that bench and he's just he's just exhausted. He's yeah, like, I don't know what the frig else I'm gonna do. That's exactly. Let me just roll up my collar. I'm I'm done for. <laughs> that's, that's, exa- that's exactly where I was going. I was like in Bond's moment of need. Tracy mm. shows up to save him. Yeah. That's and like great. it's very poetic, and like you said, it like that's why I view this Bond as kind of like a he's he's not super spy. He's like he's just spy. He's just a spy. He's just a guy doing a job. And like he's at this point, he's like, how do I avoid him? And he's kind of like just hoping for the best at that. If I'll turn my collar up, they won't, <laughs> see, they won't see me. If I drink this hot cocoa yeah. and turn this collar up, I might get away with this. Um, but we get uh, kind of him and Tracy kind of escaping yeah. in her in her car. Uh, he's wanting to get to the nearest post office to kind. Kind of alert M and MI six of what's going on, so she pulls him up to a phone booth. Uh, Bunch shooting him at him in that phone booth is great. Yeah, I he then where and gets in that thing. Yeah, so. and she just <laughs> lights it up. <laughs> uh, the car chase really good. Good. One of the yeah. first scenes where you know Bond's not actually in the car chase, and I like that Tracy's driving it, and she you see that she's kind of capable, mm-hmm. and like I like that he keeps leaning over to her and like kissing her on the cheek, and like he's very impressed with her and her skills. Look at what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, they have a great, and they end up on like they end up on like some kind of like uh, uh, race circuit with the red, like oh, some yeah. kind of race that's going on, like uh, in in the carnival, like you know, kind of festivities. And when the bad guys wind up in the middle of a race, yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. And that's just like a great little scene. Yeah. And they end up getting like you know, uh, they get knocked over, and the, their car gets messed up, and they end up able to get out of there, and they end up kind of getting stuck in a blizzard. I love that blizzard, man. Anytime <laughs> you get a heavy blizzard in a movie, right. you've got me. So uh, bad that the windshield wipers lock up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like looking at the the, the text on it. it was like super. Uh, what was it? What does it say on her little wipers? I can't remember. I remember it said something. Yeah, but they, them things didn't work. So yeah. exactly, and Bond's wiping it off, and as soon as it's wiped off, it's like right back. Yeah. So they uh, end up finding this kind of house and a little barn, and they pull the car into the, the to the barn. And again, it's another. We see earlier in the film, you know, we get a little bit of a little montage of them kind of. Um, um, you know, kind of expanding on their love story, like, you know, mm-hmm. on the beach and, you know, kind of being happy and, and going off together and, and the idea that they're really falling for each other. And then that kind of is cemented here. You get this great little, like, barn scene. It's, like, really well done, well executed, and they're kind of talking. And there's a point where, like, you think, like, Bond's going to, like, uh, you know, he's – they're talking and they're, they're – you think there's a little bit of – they're obviously they're, they're too – healthy adults in, mm-hmm. a, in a barn in a blizzard like you think they're going to have some sexy time right. and Bond's like you know we need to save this for our wedding night because he asked her to marry him he proposes he yeah. proposes in the barn and he's like hey we, this needs to happen on our wedding night I'm going to set you up on this thing and we're not going to have sexy time and he's like laying there and he takes this like farm equipment and like knocks her down and, <laughs> or she rolls on top of him and he's like it's not the New Year's yet because <laughs> that was going to be his resolution right. to like you know to do better and he's like it's not the New Year yet and like it's just a great little scene it is it works. It's, it's good stuff. It absolutely is. It's, it's just a fantastic little little uh, little scene. Um, from there, we get our second sea, uh, ski chase. Why do I keep saying sea? I can't talk tonight, Todd. We, <laughs> it's okay. get, we get our, uh, our second uh, uh, ski escape scene. They kind of chasing Bond and uh, and uh, Tracy on skis. It's it's not it's not as long and played out as the, the other. Shorter. It's it's very much shorter. I think a guy gets some. Um, 
he gets knocked into a snow mulcher. Is that what? what that oh thing? yeah, the chunks thing? of bloody snow. And this is one of those <laughs> first. This is like one of the first times in the movie. I'm like, uh, because like I was like, there. He gets sent into that mulcher, and I'm like, uh, Jimmy goes like, oh, he was full of guts yeah. or something like that. He had a lot of guts. He had a lot something. of guts. Yeah. yeah, exactly. He's like, oh, he had a lot of guts, and I'm like, it's just it's the wrong place, wrong time, yeah. Jimmy. And he's he's got. You've a done so good so far. He's got to holler it at her because they're moving <laughs> on skis. He's yeah. like, it's he's just, got a lot of guts. Yeah, he's He's got a lot of guts. I got to get it in. He had lots of guts. <laughs> like kind of thing. Like uh, it just that part kind of didn't work for me. There's right. another one later on that he does in the Lou Sheen. Um, but uh, take us through kind of our, we're kind of getting towards our third act here, Todd. Take us through uh, what's going on here in the third act. So as they're skiing through, they're going into a avalanche zone. And yeah. Blofeld kind of launches up just like, a, I guess, just a basic like uh some kind of like flare, yeah, something that makes a loud enough noise, pops to, loud enough that it causes an avalanche. Yeah, uh, exactly. They get buried, but not you know not that buried. You know? Right. I don't know how he kind of missed James because James wasn't really that buried up either. Yeah, he's they're like, very get, much, he's like get the girl. Yeah, they're very much on the surface. They're very much on top, but now you know Blofeld only takes Tracy. And mm-hmm. uh, next time we pick up with Bond, he's back at MI six. He's talking with him. Uh, I, there's something going on with Blofeld. They can't go after him. He's kind of, you know, something to do with that the blow the blow champ, you know, lineage. Uh, there's something's going on there. You know, it's off limits. There's not going to be a rescue mission. And they so, think it's too risky for a direct yeah, attack against right. his little like layer. We kind of see um, another scene uh, before here that we kind of should mention. Uh, you know. Blofeld sends out his uh, his cured allergy ladies out into the world with these oh, yes. makeup kind of cases. They get Christmas presents. It's got like a perfume atomizer and a compact that's like a radio. Yep. And the atomizer, of course, has got the toxin. Yeah, and he tells them on the, the he has them like turn on the little radio, turn the volume up, and he tells them you know, every night at midnight you need to be alone, and so I can tell you what to do and when to do it, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And that's how he's going to get this kind of biochemical out into the world. So MI six ain't going to help. Ain't going to help. Is this the first time Bond goes rogue? I think this is the first time Bond ever goes rogue. Yeah, yeah. I think it's right here. Something we see it happens a lot, right, throughout the the fifty plus yeah. years of Bond. But I think this is the first time he kind of goes rogue outside of MI6. So he, he turns to the only people he can turn to, and that's Tracy's father Tracy. and her and his crime gang. Yeah, <laughs> and exactly. So he he kind of he calls him and he's like, "Hey, I got some construction and you know, mm-hmm. demolition that demolition, needs to be done, yeah. and like you know all this kind of stuff." And like so, uh, they have a, a chopper assault on Blofeld's little lair. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and we should mention, too, we kind of forgot to overlook Bofeld this time around. It's not Donald Pleasance anymore. Telly Savalas. Telly Savalas. Good it job, was, I think. She was a hooker. <laughs> famous Norm MacDonald story. You got to look it up. Look Telly up. probably more famous for his uh, uh, cop show in the 70s, Kojak. Yes. But uh, he was I think missing, he did a good turn. He was missing his tootsie pop. Yeah. Yeah. Who loves you, Bond? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, does a, he does a good job. He like, does. I think, um, you know, Donald Pleasance was just kind of like, almost like a... Kind of like a stunt casting almost. Uh, yeah, in a way. Like in a yeah. way. Like I, like he doesn't. He really wasn't fleshed out. I mean, mm-hmm. it, Blofeld gets a little bit more screen time and a little bit more fleshed out here. I'm perfectly fine with Telly Savalas. Uh, I forgot to mention. Did you like the part where he's chasing like Bond and the skis and he's skiing with them? <laughs> Blofeld and he's mm-hmm. got that penis cap on. <laughs> did yeah. You, did you notice that? <laughs> yeah, that's a, not such a good look for him. No. Exactly. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, the the third act of the film is a is a uh, assault by Bond uh, and Tracy's father Draco and his men on on Blofeld's lair. Mm-hmm. If MI6 not going to directly attack it, he's going to get Tracy back. He's right. got he wants Blofeld bad, so he's got to he's got to go there. So um, we get the the last the, the that's the thing for me about the ending of this film. It should have ended there. It should have right. ended in that compound attack or like right around there. Mm-hmm. Like there's some good stuff. The Bond sliding across the ice. With the Bond theme? Yes. My. Classic. Yeah. That's one of those, if you put it in a Bond compilation, it's got to be When they there. get there on Her Majesty's, you see that. You see that. It's a Bond slide. And I like the, the all of them are kind of wearing the same outfit, but that like kind of, that assault outfit that he's wearing, mm-hmm. I really like that kind of, that outfit on him. But yeah, that sliding across the ice is uh, is really great. There's like a scene where he's going into a hallway and a doctor throws like some kind of like acid random at the acid at he's the like, door. Did you just fucking did, throw acid at me? Did you just fucking throw acid at me? 
exactly. <laughs> uh, he's chasing Blowfield down. He finds his like kind of secret board of like how he's going to disperse this mm-hmm. thing. He has uh, another gadget that we kind of see in the movie is like uh, the little like spy camera. Uh, that's another kind of point to go back to. Let me let me go through here. We don't see. That's a point to make too. Light on the gadgets. And oh, thank yeah, God, definitely. And that's 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 perfect to me. There doesn't need to be a lot of gadgets here. Like you get again, we get the DB5 Vantage. We get um, uh, Tracy's uh, 69 Mercury Cougar. That uh, safe cracking slash copier. Yep. <laughs> um, did you notice the uh, the AR7 rifle from From Russia with Love in his glove box? Where he kind of looks at her through the scope. Yep. Yeah. The radioactive lint. <laughs> the Q was developing for yeah. some reason. Because he's Q, the I guess. The spy camera, and then we have that vanity case, and that's pretty much it. Like, that's that's all, and that's all you need. That's like, the ones that work the best for me. The lightest on the gadgets yeah. are usually the better Bond films, exactly. honest to God. That's the thing with the Craig films. They look, they go a little crazy, too. They like, do. Like, kind of at the end, and, like, if you could stay away from that to me, some people will probably love it, and they mm-hmm. love the super spy stuff. I like the more realistic, the less gadgets, the less less situation-based gadgets, the better. Right. Like, just give him, give him a gun and a fucking, <laughs> and his fucking, Turn him loose. and his suit, and and then turn him loose. Yeah, exactly. That's that's pretty much like all you need there for me. Um, but yeah, we get the the rest of the attack on the base, and then Blofeld ends up getting away, and he goes in a in a luge, mm-hmm. and that's the weakest part of the movie to me. Yeah. I do not care for the, the luge, luge chase. Thing. It's it's a it's too much. It's too reliant on uh, the rear projection, and right. it's a little wonky, and it's. I just I feel it's the weakest part. That's why I say I wish it would have kind of just stayed at the compound. Yeah, something going on there with them too, and let Blofeld get away. Like he ends up Bond chases after him on his own luge. Mm-hmm. Blofeld ends up uh, dropping a grenade on the track. I was going to ask you, uh, did you catch that? Uh, you know, Blofeld is driving his own luge, mm-hmm. and he's got the two controls in his hand. I guess he lets one go to get the grenade out, and he's like, well, what am I going to do? i got to control the luge. I'll just put the grenade with the pin between my fucking teeth. <laughs> so he's got a grenade dangling from his mouth by the pin, driving his luge. Right. Of course he's going to drop of it. Of course he's dropping it. Yeah, I, did, I did notice that <laughs> yeah. now that you mentioned it. Yeah, But he ends up finding it after he's like scuffling around like, oh, where's, uh, the, where's this pain. grenade? <laughs> Let me throw it behind me. Yeah, and he throws it at Bond. Bond gets knocked out of his out of his luge, and then he ends up catching up to Blofeld and jumping onto his, and they have a little fight, and he ends up knocking Blofeld up as he passes under like a tree branch. Right. And it kind of like grabs Blofeld by the neck pretty uh. much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he has another quip there. And I can't remember what the hell he says for the life of I me. I can't either. He does. But I, can't uh, I can't remember. I'm pu- I'll sure I'll put a clip in here. Uh, of Cody exact- will find it and he'll yeah, drop it. There'll be in. a clip in here. Don't worry. <laughs> He's branched off. Uh, and then we see uh, the little line at the not the line at the end, but uh, there's a little scene between uh, uh, Bond and like a little rescue dog kind of thing. Kind of that uh, cliched Swiss Alps rescue dog. Yeah, and he's like, "Go get the brandy." He's like, "Forget <laughs> about the rest of this. Go get the brandy." Go get the brandy. Uh, I, I heard that line was actually improvised on the day by Lazenby, from what I was reading. Cool. Um, and then we get Tracy. Uh, she's kind of in that compound too. She was taken away by her father. He actually knocks her out and he's like, spare the rod and spoil the child. Hey, she don't want to leave without James. And he's like, you're getting on this copter. He just gives it the old two piece and a biscuit. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. So at the end of the film, we move on to, um, we think at that point, you kind of are led to believe that kind of Blofeld is kind of hang, you know, hung and like is dead. Could be dead. Um, and we move on to, uh, Bond's wedding. Believe it or not, folks. Yeah, Bond does go through with his he wedding to married. Tracy. We see he goes back um, before we kind of see the ring that she, he, he would have been They looking at a ring earlier. They yep. go back and get that ring. He goes back and gets that ring for her. They have uh, the wedding ceremony. M's there. Q, Q Money Penny. Money oh, pennies. Bond and Money Penny. Yeah, they have that little Can look. Can I get through this? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> they, have that, they have that look, that little like. You he know. tosses her the hat. Yep. <laughs> and Q's like, he has no respect for Governor <laughs> He's like, he looks down, he's like, he's got no respect for Governor Property. <laughs> and then M's having a conversation with Tracy's father, Draco, mm-hmm. because, like, obviously they've been, uh, they've had uh, some kind of uh, conflicts in the past since he's, uh, he's uh, you know, kind of a, uh, 
uh, a criminal as well. Yeah. Uh, and then we see, you know, that last little look between Bond and Money Penny, and him and Tracy drive off in Bond's car, which is kind of adorned with flowers and stuff from the wedding. Mm-hmm. They're going through the 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 uh, the little mountain pass there. Uh, they get passed by, I guess, I don't know if it's like wedding goers or just some kids in in a car. They say something like, your car looks like a flower shop. Or it's like they kinda. say something like, say it with flowers or something. Like yeah. sounds like a, a, a ad for a flower shop. Yeah. And Bond's like, yeah, it sounds like we do kind of look like an ad for a flower shop. So yeah. he pulls the car over the side of the road, starts taking off the, the flowers off the side, and she's kind of talking to him. And they have a little, you know, kind of good banter in the car about, you know, where we're going to start, three kids, you know, yeah. three boys, three girls, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, he's taking the flowers off of the car. Um, they kind of have a little like kind of kiss scene out the window, and then you see a car coming from behind. Oh man! And who is it? It's, it's, uh, it's Irma Blunt and Blofeld. It's Blofeld with his little his little uh, fucking got a little neck brace. <laughs> it makes me fucking sick every time I see that shot. I really it makes me angry <laughs> with his little. Like, you just want to beat the shit out yeah, of him. Yeah, you just want to beat the shit out of him. And she they drive by, and it's a drive by, and Blunt in the back. Um, she fires off a couple shots, mm-hmm. misses Bond completely. Bond goes around to the driver's side. And he's like, it's Blofeld. He gets in the car, and then you look over, and the camera pans, and there's a, a single bullet through the the front windshield mm-hmm. right into Tracy's head. Oh, man. <laughs> and it's one of the most tragic endings of any film that you'll see. Like right. it, re- And it's a Bond film. It hits. And it's a, <laughs> it's, you would never, never expect it. Like, honestly, like, I, you know, the first time I ever seen it, that was the scene that really, like, stuck out to me. Mm-hmm. And, like, you see a policeman f- pull up to beside Bond, and he's not talking to the policeman. He's talking to himself. Yeah. He's trying to convince himself of what he's saying. Exactly. And he's, he's it just, it, it tears your heart out. He's like, she's having a rest. Mm-hmm. There's no hurry. We're going to uh, be going on in a bit. Yeah. We got all the time We got all the, the time in the world. And in the end, the, I think the film overall, it's a film about, tragedy it begins with with tracy trying to end her own life Mm -hmm. and like over the course of the film bond saves her body and soul and then she saves him body and soul right and in the moment teresa bond most wanted to live her life was taken Man, Cody, when you put it like that, <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Though. Yeah, you're I right. mean that's that's and that's and it's at the end of the day, like I think it's a it's really a film about tragedy, and it's single handedly the biggest piece of character development James Bond would ever have. Like you said, until Casino Royale. Until you get to Casino Royale. And the the problem with it though, um, is what do they do with it in the rest of the films? Nothing. Nothing. Because what do we do next? We bring Sean Connery back. We bring Sean back. We get right into Diamonds Are Forever. And we don't talk about it until, I think, a Roger Moore film where he visits her grave. I think there's, yeah, Roger visits her grave. I think there's a a scene in Spy Who Loved Me where Triple X is kind of going over Bond's dossier. And he gets, she mentions a wife and he's like, you know, that's enough. Right, (laughs) right. And then later on, I think in License to Kill, there's like a... You know, uh, Felix Leiter and his wife as if got married, and you know, Bond's kind of leaving, and he seems kind of sad, and, mm-hmm. and he kind of says, "Well, you know, he was married once right. a long time ago." Exactly. So they do kind of half-ass acknowledge it, right? But on. I mean, as far as like what comes immediately next, and I mean, forgot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we go back to super spy bullshit, and we have the weakest of the seven films because this is the sixth Bond film. The seventh film is the weakest one in both of our opinions of the first seven right. by far when you get to Diamonds Are Forever. So you kind of squander everything that you have here. But as far as just this film in itself and that last scene, it cuts to pieces, man. It's it's And it's executed so well except for one problem that I have. I hate that that Bond music kicks in. I, it's almost like they had to throw it in there. Like, it's going to be okay, folks. Yeah, He's still James Bond. Yeah. It's all right. Stop having a panic attack. <laughs> Breathe. Breathe. He he's, will he's, return. He's still alive. Yeah. He it, will come back. I wish, uh, and I've seen people like uh, in researching and looking at things for the film, I've seen people say that it should have ended with the song that you hear before, which is We Have All the Time in the World. Mm-hmm. That's how it should have ended. It should have ended on that somber note. I don't like that they put the Bond music in there. That would have been a much better way to do it. It, it would have. But like still, like if I edited that movie, like I'm sure somebody has a cut where they cut out that last <laughs> they cut out that last five minutes. Like it should just end there on that very somber note and then go into some other somber music. But otherwise, a perfect a perfectly tragic ending for that movie. Exactly. Um, so Todd Let's uh, let's go into some stuff here uh, for uh, we kind of kind of talk about before we get into the wrap up here. Um, 
So George Lazenby, he comes in for this role. Mm-hmm. To me, um, he knocked it out of the park. Does a great job. I um, think. That's it's my a, opinion. It's uh, another tragedy of this is that he did not come back. Yeah. He made the decision. Again, we talked about becoming Bond. Um, you know, there was a lot of pressure on him. There was a lot of, like, outside influences. There was a lot of things going on with his life. He felt very pressured to sign a contract to come back for six movies. Right. He stated that he was offered a million dollars under the table to do it. He was kind of unhappy with some of the rules and restrictions they had upon him about how he could look, and they wanted him. It wasn't good enough to just play James Bond. He had to look at, at all times. had to be James Bond. And that yeah. was some of the reason that drove Sean Connery away from this, this series is he was tired of having to be James Bond. Right. He couldn't just be Sean Connery outside of himself. He had to be James Bond at all times. And that was some of the reason that George felt that he wanted to walk away and he wanted to live his own life. And that's one of the good things about that documentary is that it doesn't end tragically. He's not broke and destitute. He said he went on to do real estate mm-hmm. and made – Oh, good living for himself. Right. And he married and had children. Yes. He missed the loves of his life, Belinda, mm-hmm. uh, which again, please watch that documentary. It's awesome. It's, it's great. But you know, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a, a tragic, sad story for how it all wrapped up for him, but it is, it is so sad that he did not come back because he should have, he should have been the one to carry this on. Connery should never have come back. Yeah. As much as I love Connery, exactly, I'm yeah. on record as saying he is holistically the best Bond. Sean's my man, but I will agree. <laughs> but George Lazenby should have took this into a new era. It should have been brought back. This kind of feels like what the Craig movies was. It was bringing it back to a grounded level. Right. It was making it more human. Kind of a soft reboot. And more more humanized and more character-driven and less super spy. And it, it, it very much, Casino Royale and this feel very much like companion pieces in a way, but right. they're not attached, obviously, but they feel very much in the same kind of vein as each other. And, like, that's what it should have been. He should have been the one to carry this on, um, you know, before handing it off to someone else eventually. But, like, it's a shame that he didn't because I really would have liked this guy to come back. Because I would have loved this scene at least one more. At least one more. <laughs> he even said that, too. He's like, I should have done two. Yeah. Just to make people believe I wasn't fired. Right. Like, that kind of thing. Like, yeah. it's really, a, really the big shame of this is he didn't come back. I understand his reasons, and I get it. Um, You know, and he was kind of blackballed from Hollywood. He couldn't really get any work as an actor anyway, even if he wanted to. Like, you know, they, they kind of blackballed him out of, out, of, out of working and out of Hollywood. So he didn't have much choice but to do something else but it's really just a shame because i'm telling you like the guy in my mind like you know if i if i had my choice really honestly if i had my choice to make a movie and like i could have any actor from that prime and put them in as bond i'd pick him yeah like i mean i love brosnan i love connery i love craig but as far as look and voice and and mannerisms and he's got like He's got the, the coolness and the cockiness and the looks and everything, but he also seems like a real person. Yeah. You know what I mean? He doesn't feel like just like a cold as ice killer, and he doesn't feel like he's just like love him and leave him, James. Yeah. Like, you know, and like I, I know I'm always going to survive this, and I know I'm, I'm going to get out without a scratch kind of guy. Right. Like he feels like a real person. And like I think this is, again, it's an overlooked classic of the series, and it should, if people don't, haven't really visited this as much and really don't have as much reverence for it. I think that's a mistake. I think it is one of the – I think it's in that next tier right under a Goldfinger in a, in a Casino Royale, honestly. Right. I think it gets to that level. Yeah, if you somehow manage to not watch on her Magic Secret Services because, oh, it's just that one where that guy played him one time. Yeah. I'm not going to be bothered with that. You know, don't do yourself that disservice. You need to watch this movie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and You Only Live Twice, when it was released, it was the first Bond film to not make back uh, more than the previous one. It lost money. It didn't lose money, but it didn't make as much as the the, the ones before it. This was the same way. It, it was it, it lost. It, it, it come in at a loss compared to what You Only Live Twice did. Um, but, like, it was kind of kind of, I guess, poorly received in a way. Like, I think... It, people just it wasn't Connery. It wasn't Sean Connery. And like people just weren't, I don't think, ready for it as much. He back gets then. married, you know, I maybe I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it had something to do with it. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, at, at the time of this, which we'll go into it, I mean, like, uh he was twenty nine when he did this. I think he was a, ain't he the youngest Bond? Yes. That's what I yep, thought. Yeah. Speaking of that, let's let's go into it. You want some Bond bits let's in Let's go. Yet? Let's go. All right. So <laughs> as of uh twenty twenty one, George Lazenby is the youngest actor to portray 007 at age 29 during filming. The rest of the actors and their ages in no particular order. Sir Sean Connery was 31. 
Sir Roger Moore was 45. That one shocked me. Yes. I did not realize Roger was that old That's when why he started. He's almost 60 by the end. <laughs> uh, he was like 57, I think, in A View to a Kill. I and think you're right. Man, yeah. I can't wait to get there. Oh, man. Uh, Timothy Dalton was 40. Pierce Brosnan was 41. And Daniel Craig was 38. Wow. Uh, during filming at Piz Gloria, the cast and crew received their per diems and cash. Upon seeing George Lazenby with a suitcase stuffed full of cash, Telly Savalas invited him to a late night poker game that he regularly held with crew members and promptly re uh, relieved Lazenby of having to carry so much extra weight. Upon hearing of this, producer Harry Saltzman visited the location, joined the game over Savalas' protest, and won back Lazenby's money. He then informed Savalas in no uncertain terms that he was not to victimize his boy Lazenby again. Uh. George Lazenby suggested a scene where Bond skis off a cliff and opens a parachute. This was scrapped as the filmmakers lacked the resources to pull it off. It was used as the opening for what film, Todd? That would be The Spy Who Loved Me. The Spy Who Loved Me. <laughs> Having secured a suit ordered but uncollected by Sir Sean Connery and getting a Rolex and haircut like him, George Lazenby talked his way into meeting producer Albert R. Broccoli, producer Harry Saltzman, and director Peter R. Hunt. After bluffing his way through the meeting and falsely claiming he had wide acting credits, he secured a screen test. Lazenby then confessed to Hunt that he made it all up and he wasn't an actor. Hunt laughed and told him, you just strolled in here and managed to uh, fool two of the most ruthless bastards in the business. You're an actor. Uh, let's see. I'm going to pronounce this name. Is it Ilse Stippitz? We'll go with that. Yeah. <laughs> Only English language role was as Irma Bunt in this movie. Uh, she was not able to enjoy her success. She died of a heart attack less than a week after the release of this movie, Dang. making it her final film role. The character of Irma Bunt was intended to return in the next James Bond movie, Diamonds Are Forever. But because of her death, the character did not return. Sir Sean Connery later said that he would have preferred to do a Bond movie like this one as opposed to Only Live Twice. I bet he did. I bet. <laughs> uh, the theme, We Have All the Time in the World, was the last thing that Louis Armstrong ever recorded. He died two years later. It is also the first theme song in the film franchise not to include the movie's title as part of the lyrics. This is Christopher Nolan's favorite Bond movie, and many references can be found in Inception. He said, what I liked about it that we tried to emulate in this film is there's a tremendous balance in that movie of action and scale and romanticism and tragedy and emotion. I think that's, I think that's, that's spot on. Very fair. George Lazenby wanted to do most of his own stunts, but the studio wouldn't allow him. During the shooting of one of the stunt scenes, Lazenby broke his arm, thereby delaying the filming of many of his later scenes. When James Bond is taken to Ernst Stavro Blofeld's lab at Piz Gloria, Lazenby's broken arm uh, in its cast is hidden by his coat, which was draped over his arm. Blofeld's guard removes it from him as Lazenby was unable to do so. This featured the only signature gun barrel sequence of all James Bond movies in which Bond drops down to one knee while shooting at the audience. It's also the only version of the sequence where the descending blood completely erases Bond's image, leaving only the red circle. Oh. I did notice that when I was watching last night. I was like, I couldn't remember. I was like, is that different? I think it is. Uh, for the opening sequence, railroad ties were buried under the sand to allow Bond's Aston Martin to drive on the beach. Bond's line to the St. Bernard about getting to the brandy was improvised with George Lazenby, as I mentioned. Good job, George. Uh, my last Bond bit here for you, Todd. No Time to Die drew heavily from this film in its plot, themes, and tone. It also featured the 1969 Aston Martin DBS and Louis Armstrong's song, We Have All the Time in the World. So, Todd, we rank films on a 1 to 10 scale. Starting from 1, the ranks are Torture, 2, Awful, 3, Bad, 4, Subpar, 5, Mediocre, 6, Decent, 7, Good, 8, Great, 9, Amazing, 10, Masterpiece. Todd, give us your final thoughts and review score for On Her Majesty's Secret Service. On Her Majesty's Secret Service uh, will always, I think, have that label of being an oddity and an outlier in this series, and it does not deserve that. Uh, this is a great movie, in my opinion. Uh, I think George Lazenby, in my opinion, did an admirable job as 007. My only regret, he didn't stick around for more. Uh, that's one of the what would have ever happens we'll always have in this series. Uh, an underappreciated gem, I give Honor Majesty Secret Service an 8, which on our scale is great. Yeah, I absolutely echo everything. Like I said, it's a, it's the biggest tragedy to come from this film is not only the, the death of uh, Teresa Bond, it is the fact that Lazenby was not able to come back and reprise his role as James Bond because I think he makes a hell of a James Bond, in my opinion. He's the most, um, I think probably the most 
like Ian Fleming envisioned him in his own head when he created the character and what you probably read on the page of every Bond book from what I understand from people that are more familiar with that material and read the books. He seems like that was probably the closest to his idealized version of Bond. And it certainly is for me. I think this is an overlooked gem of the Bond franchise. I think it's, it's up there with some of the best offerings that this film series has. And so for that reason, I'm in agreement, Todd, and I give on Her Majesty's Secret Service an 8 out of 10, which ranks it as great. Todd, tell everyone how they can find us and stay up to date with us on social media. We are at Tau Capes on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Tau Capes Podcast on Facebook. You can also email us at TauCapesPod at gmail.com. If you enjoy the show, please consider following us on your podcast platform of choice and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Popcorn Mumbles will return next week. We want to thank you so much for listening. Till next time. Bye, guys. See you, guys. <clears throat> I'd like them to know that you can defy what is expected of you and write your own story. <laughs>